You're listening to Tim Bulkley's 5-Minute Bible. I was asked recently about the so-called doctrine of headship. I've got a podcast about it. But it caused some reflection. And While I was in church on Sunday morning when we were celebrating the communion, it struck me that, really, most people's approaches to this question are daft frankly. You see, unless you're an extreme Catholic or an extreme brethren, you don't take the wine of the Eucharist, the communion, literally. You don't drink alcoholic wine at communion if you're a nonconformist like me. Us Baptists drink unfermented grape juice. We do it because uh, in the 19th century and since, we've come to realise that there are, or there may be, alcoholics in our congregation for whom just a little drink could be the tipping point. And out of sensitivity to them, we use non-alcoholic wine. And nobody thinks it's strange. On the wine of the communion, we're not literalists. But some of us become literalists when we turn to the Bible. Of course, no language is ever entirely literal. And most language is quite a bit more than literal. For example, back when you were courting, or now while you're courting, if you get a communication from the person that you hope will love you, you read it carefully, poring over every line and letter and trying to catch the nuances of meaning. And the last thing you do is take it literally. It's similar with almost every kind of writing, except perhaps legal documents and a few specialist kinds of literature like that. We don't read them literally. We read them carefully and trying to understand what the author meant. And that seems to me that in my other podcast, I've shown that what Paul means by using head as picture language is not what we think of when we use head as picture language. You see, there's been lots of argument about just what kephale, head, might mean in Greek as picture language at the time of Paul. When Good Grudem did a huge study of a vast number of ancient Greek documents from a couple of centuries before through to about that time, he uses his study to argue that kephale could mean chief or boss. Except that even Grudem himself recognises that only 2% of most of the passages he looked at have kephale, meaning possibly head or boss. One of the things he overlooks is that some of those passages are translations of the Old Testament into Greek. Now, the translation of rosh, head, into Greek is really interesting, because the Old Testament, Hebrew, does use rosh, meaning head, to mean the chief. But when the Septuagint translators render rosh, one of the times when they consistently, or almost consistently, don't render it by kephale, head, rosh head, kephale head, one of the few times they don't, is when they're translating it and it means chief. There are a few places where they do, but fairly consistently they don't. So the translators of the Septuagint actually recognised that kephale did not mean chief. But it's more than just an argument over what the Greek word means. You see, this headship talk very often goes along with an authoritarian approach to life more generally, and in particular to the life of the church. We don't need to look at what's happened in recent weeks to Mark Driscoll, one of the most outspoken proponents of all this headship stuff and of a macho approach to Christianity, to know that he's got it wrong. We don't need to argue over the meaning of a particular word in Greek to know he's got it wrong. We just need to read the Bible. Isaiah and Jesus and others of the Bible writers recognised that God detests pride. Listen to Isaiah. Their land is full of idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their fingers have made. 
So man will be brought low and mankind humbled. Do not forgive them. Go to the rocks, hide in the ground from dread of the Lord and the splendor of his majesty. The eyes of the arrogant man will be humbled and the pride of men brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. The Lord Almighty has a day in store for all the proud and the lofty, for all that is exalted. They will be humbled, for all the cedars of Lebanon, tall and lofty, and all the oaks of Bashan, for all the towering mountains and all the high hills, for every lofty tower and every fortified wall, for every trading ship and every stately vessel. The arrogance of man will be brought low, and the pride of men humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, and the idols will totally disappear. Similarly, in a culture where real men responded to threats with resistance and to insults with threats, Jesus says this. You've heard that it was said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn in the other also. Pride, arrogance and machismo are things God detests. So whatever Paul might have meant by head, he did not mean headship in the sense of bossing it over someone else. That much is clear to anyone who really reads the Bible.